So I'm sitting here with uh, Dr. Chris Wagstaff, uh, and we're very glad to have you here here at the Boson 2018. Uh, and thank you for a very good lecture about organizational psych psychology. Uh, first of all, could you tell us a little bit about yourself yeah. and about this emerging field? Yeah, sure. So uh, I'm employed at the University of Portsmouth um, as a uh, principal lecturer and I, um, uh, I operate as the pathway lead for psychology within the Department of Sport and Exercise Sciences. Um, I work as an applied practitioner but also supervise a number of trainee practitioners um, and educate uh, by lecturing on undergraduate graduate masters and doctoral programs of work. Um, in terms of the emergence of organisational psychology in sport, uh, this field really emerged through a dissatisfaction with uh, working solely or exclusively on a one-to-one -one basis uh, with athletes. And while uh, counselling skills and psychological skills are arguably our bread and butter, our basic skills in our training, there are a number of other opportunities and needs in applied practice to examine and understand the environments in which our athletes, coaches and support staff operate. So perhaps moving beyond individual uh, interventions, team interventions, and looking at the broader cultural and environmental factors that influence on uh, those individual stakeholders. Yeah, and that's a very interesting approach and one that I've been noticing pops up with, yeah, you mentioned Hendrickson's work yes. and it pops up in different conference, conferences. Is, is it possible for a sports psychology practitioner to do all this, both the, the counselling part and, uh, yeah. and, uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, the organisational part? Yeah, so I think it does present um, challenges perhaps in our training, development, our education pathways. We're perhaps inadequately prepared at the moment as practitioners to undertake these organisational interventions. We have a, a very solid foundational skill in psychological skills provision, but very uh, poor awareness as applied practitioners, in my experience, of the real world, the, uh, the environments of elite performance. Now, providing the two skills and two types of interventions might also provide challenges. Uh, boundaries of practice, conflicts of interest when you're working perhaps in a in a performance team and then at a broader organisational level. There are potential issues there but I think in terms of uh, uh, better preparing our practitioners there's lots that we can do in both education and, and training pathways to better prepare our practitioners to provide those skills um, and in a transparent and uh, fully disclosed way. Nice. Thank you for that. And uh, so you, then you mentioned you had a slide with psychology, sociology and management and yes. kind of bringing together. Is, is that a future of sports psychology, do you think? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, David Fletcher and I, uh, back in 2009, talked about a twilight zone between um, sports psychology and sports management. And we, we located organizational issues at that twilight zone. But I think as um, a number of the methods that we use in, in research in this area are drawn from sociology, you know, um, ethnography, action research, narrative accounts, cultural perspectives um, require immersion and require a number of skills from sociology. And so perhaps there's a tripartite or a three-way relationship there between psychology, management and sociology. Cool. And um, looking at organization, you mentioned some numbers that in elite English football, like it's almost a change in organization once every year. Yes. Um, and uh, what what effect does that have on clubs and the players? Yeah, I, I think the recent statistics on managers in um, the leagues in in England in in football suggest that the average tenure of a manager is 1.23 years, um, which is a very short amount of time. Some managers have significantly less than that. And what often happens, um, for, you know, in, in terms of what we've observed in our research, is that that managerial change leads to substantial changes throughout the organisation, and all of the employees, so that's athletes, coaches and support staff, are affected for a number of months following a managerial change. You know, some uh, of these individuals report feeling um, 
uh, pulled in one direction by one regime and then pulled in another for several months and then that manager turns over and they're pulled back in another direction. So there's lots of uncertainty, destabilisation when these changes occur and it, it often, in our experience it took a, a period of approximately six months for people, for employees uh, to settle down into new um, ways of working and integrate the new regime's uh, preferences. Now, if it takes six months to change, uh, that gives a very short amount of time for an incoming manager to, um, uh, to be successful. And perhaps after six months, their, in their employment has already been terminated if, if those practices aren't successfully embedded. So there's basically almost organizational change going on all the time in yeah. these organizations. Organisations at the elite level of sport are very turbulent, they're very volatile, they're um, vulnerable to these sorts of changes and, and those changes impose numerous challenges for the people who operate within those environments. Now, the sort of things that we could do uh, as psychologists is try and um, smooth the transition between those periods of organisational change, advise at different levels of an organisational hierarchy to perhaps they can help an incoming manager when uh, change occurs. Uh, also work with other individuals to better engage with new regimes and new ideas, but to, to perhaps institutionalise some of the sports science and medicine practices in these environments so there isn't so much disruption when a new figurehead and new manager comes in and has new ideas. Um, I also think that sports psychologists are excellently placed to advise on um, people experiencing adverse responses to those uh, situations. So we can equip people with coping skills, we can uh, work with them on a one-to-one -one basis, but perhaps we can also advise on the organisation dynamics to prevent so much change as well and, and more long-term visions and the articulation of that vision. That sounds like a great uh, thing for, for a sports psychology to be aware about and to, to handle and also address these more maladaptive coping uh, resources that you mentioned during the lecture as well. Yeah, absolutely. From the um, research that I spoke about, some individuals in response to those periods of organisational change develop what they perceive to be short-term effective strategies, but they were quite maladaptive or problematic in the long term. Some buried their head in the sand and were resistant to change. Um, some gossiped, some engaged in counterproductive work behaviours. Others tried to seize opportunities or undertake a power grab. Some tr moved on from the organisation. And I think the message here is that we don't adequately prepare athletes, coaches or support staff for the high performance environments that they face, the, the turbulence and the change that characterises elite sport. So that's great. Thank you very much for giving us more knowledge about organisational psychology and for bringing this research and open up uh, with all your work to organisational sports psychology. Thank you very much. My, my pleasure. It's a pleasure to be here. And we hope to see you here again in Stockholm and at SIP conference at Pusa in the future. Thank you. Thank you.